Hi, this is uh, Jaime Gonzalez with the Katy Prairie Conservancy and Coastal Prairie Partnership here in Houston, Texas. And I'm here to talk to you a little bit about why planting native matters. So why we believe that using indigenous plants to a region are really beneficial and how that compares and contrasts with making pollinator gardens from using plants from different parts of the world. So one thing I want to mention real quickly is uh, this is not um, a talk that's meant to uh, demonize exotic plants or their use. There are a lot of exotic plants that can be very useful in a lot of ways. But we also uh, get asked a lot of questions about what plant material to use if we are trying to conserve wildlife. And so we did want to talk about this today um, by doing this presentation. So as I mentioned um, earlier, um, at the Conservancy, people oftentimes call us and say, well, I'd really like to help conserve monarch butterflies, native bee populations, and wild birds that are in decline. So what I want to do is I want to create habitat in my house or my schoolyard or a local park. And what should we do and what should we plant? And this is really what's prompted this talk today um, because there's a lot of information flying around. And uh, so we wanted to go ahead and put forth our thinking on this topic. So one thing to, to start off with is the fact that um, a pollinator garden using exotic plants can be both aesthetically just gorgeous and also useful for wildlife. So we don't want to say that uh, folks should not plant exotic species from different parts of the world. That's not the point. Here's a great example. This is a, a, a pollinator garden, butterfly garden, that was planted by the uh, master naturalist down in Rosenberg, Texas. And if you go there... It's very apparent really quickly how, how neat these plants are and how valuable they are. They uh, attract just a cloud of pollinating um, uh, insects, including butterflies and bees. It's also really beautiful. People take a lot of pictures there. And so from an aesthetic standpoint and from a providing nectar standpoint, um, these butterfly gardens or pollinator gardens using exotic plants from everywhere actually are really neat and they do a lot of good. So like I said, we're not here to, to uh, uh, say that these are, these are not good, these are not valuable, and the people putting them in are not doing something good. These are valuable. What we're here to do uh, instead is to kind of shed some light on why we choose um, native indigenous plants, what a native indigenous plant is, and, uh, and why we think that using ind indigenous plants allows you to go uh, much deeper than a pollinator garden or butterfly garden using exotic plants. It allows you to do a lot of things that you simply can't do when you use exotic plants in a planting. So real quickly, we have a, a program called Prairie Builders Schools and Parks, and we've had this program in place now for about five years. And this program um, is fairly simple in concept. Basically what we do is we work with a whole bunch of uh, local schools, uh, public spaces, parks, um, and um, even governmental agencies to try to help situate uh, native uh, coastal prairie pockets on school campuses and local parks and things like that. Now, even though I'm talking about coastal prairie pocket gardens uh, in this presentation, I think this concept is, is uh, transferable to any ecosystem or any location in the U.S. Just substitute whatever your local ecosystem is for, for pocket prairie, and many of the same values hold um, for those ecosystems as well as the, the coastal prairie pocket gardens we're talking about today. So these are some good examples. There are three pictures, as you see right there, from local schools where we um, use these pocket uh, prairies to teach a variety of subjects, um, from history to ecology to economics um, to uh, photography and everything in between. So if we're going to talk about what the value of native plants are and why we think we, you can use them to go deeper than an exotic pollinator garden, we got to first define what a native plant is. So a native plant can be defined in a number of ways, but I like some of the definitions uh, that I got uh, recently at a talk where I asked some conservation experts from the greater Houston area, well, what is a native plant? Because that plant, that name, uh, native plant has been used in a lot of different ways, and it's a little bit squishy at this point. And I kind of like, um, uh, I'm going to take a few of these, these comments real quick that I found to be very useful. One was from Andy Sippets, who's a local conservation habitat biologist with Texas Parks. 
And he said, my definition of native plant is one that is indigenous to the region and the soil type as defined by its genotype and which can be recognized by its physical character as best um, to your ability to determine. So basically what Andy's saying there is, first of all, it's a plant that has been um, adapted for a long time um, to its, its particular soils and climate of that region. Um, and this has been a long process of adaptation. It's not been um, just a few years. It's very well adapted, and it's, and it's adapted from a genetic standpoint. Um, my friend Flo Hanna um, from the Houston Audubon Society added that I often use the term locally native and restrict the area I call native to the upper Texas coast. The parameters of what I consider good plant or seed material to use in an area reconstruction, restoration, or gardening project is limited to Harris or adjacent counties. So what, what, um, what Flo is getting to there is that not only is this plant well adapted um, to our climate and our soils, which some exotic species can be as well. It's, it's that there are wild populations of that species within a very short uh, distance. So when we talk about geography, um, we often, as conservation biologists, we often say that we have a kind of a rule of thumb that uh, the plant material, the seed material for those plants should probably come from within about 100 miles of the planting project. Um, and that will ensure that that plant is a pretty good fit for what you need and it is genetically similar to plants that might have existed on that site when we're doing a reconstruction or a restoration project. So these native plants are genetically adapted for your area. They are relatively close in location. And lastly, and this is very important, they have been in that area oftentimes for a long time. They're often ancient to your area. A um, good example of this is um, I've had the privilege of working on a couple of fossil digs here recently um, looking at Ice Age uh, mammals. And what we find when we look at the pollen record is that some of the same species we're using in local prairie restorations are represented in those pollen samples, which means that some of these uh, native plants that are in your area have been there for tens of thousands of years. This is a really, really long history of being in your area. And this is going to really figure in our conversation when we talk about why pl uh, planting natives matters. It's this long history of association with wildlife in the area that is a real key to why using native plants, we believe, is preferable to using exotic plants if you're going to make a pollinator garden or a butterfly garden. All right, so let's get into it. So why planting native matters. What we're going to do is we're going to give you six quick reasons. We're not going to go real in depth. We're going to give you six quick reasons for why using native plant material can allow you to do things that you can't do if you make a pollinator garden or a butterfly garden or a bird garden using exotic species. Uh, like I said before, it's not that exotic species are bad. We all have exotic species in our yard. We have food uh, plants that come from all over the world, thank goodness. We have uh, roses that are treasured as family heirlooms. We have gardenias. We have all these things. Those are all great plants. But if you are trying to save wildlife, we do think that using indigenous plants is preferable for a number of reasons. And part, most of that is that it allows you in a limited space to do many more things if you use native plants than if you use exotic plants. So here's one of those things. One of the things that we're always trying to do is we're not just trying to save the butterflies and the bees and the birds. We're trying to root people in place. And that's because a lot of times folks have a hard time um, in this very globalized, mobile um, uh, situation that we're in today, kind of feeling at home. Where am I in the world? In our architecture, which tends to be strip malls with the same variety of stores no matter where you go, the layout of the roads and other things tend to bring a sameness to everything. So we want to we want to battle against that. We want to make sure that people know how special a place they live in, how it's unique, how it's both the same and different as other places. So one of the things that we do is we use a plant palette that is situated to their place and has been there for literally thousands of years. Um, so this is important for a number of reasons. One is it helps us to tell the story of these highly endangered ecos local ecosystems like the coastal prairie. But it also 
uh, by using a plant palette that is that is adapted genetically to your area, it allows people to see seasons. And that's really a critical thing. Oftentimes when we use plant palettes from all over the world, it kind of throws off your vision of the seasons and when things turn brown and when they brighten up in the spring and how they transform in the, in the summer. And the seasonality is one way of really getting uh, this idea of where you live in the world. But it's also important from this perspective as well. Oftentimes people have a hard time because of the transformation of the landscape understanding what is the ecological bedrock of the area. So for Houston, um, and this is true of wherever you are, um, there are historical landscapes that were there when the first uh, European settlers got there. In Houston, much of the green area in this map that I'm showing you was a tall grass prairie called the Coastal Prairie. Very few people, including folks who were born here, know that. Um, and so consequently, we've had a long um, and, and complicated history with this ecosystem that many people don't know, but it's really important. So reason number one is we like to teach people where they live on the earth um, so they can take better care of it and maybe appreciate it a little bit more and its, and its um, uniqueness. So reason number one is we like to teach a sense of place. And you can really see this when we go to local schools. These are some kids at Carnegie Vanguard uh, High School, a very um, gifted high school here in Houston, and we're helping them to create what's called the Sky Prairie. This prairie is actually on the top of their, their roof, which overlooks downtown. And when we go out and we teach with them, um, we talk to them about the history of their neighborhood, uh, as it was once a prairie. We talk to them about the history of these plants, what associations they have with wildlife, and it helps them as they're looking at downtown Houston to see that association between ancient historic landscapes in this very modern, vibrant, globalized city. Going just a little bit further real quickly, um, we use history a lot when we're, uh, when we're teaching at local schools uh, about uh, prairies. So you can see all these pictures. These are pictures of different places in Houston when they were prairies. Um, and if you look around town, there are all kinds of signs that we were a prairie community, such as uh, Prairie Street downtown. And this association with our, our prairies and how they were used for agriculture, as you look at that city seal of Houston, basically it's saying that you can move goods and services via rail. And those goods and services oftentimes are coming right out of the ground, right out of those rich prairie soils. And in Texas, when we talk about Texan identity and, and all that, it's, it's impossible to understand Texan identity without knowing what a prairie is because much of what we think about Texas and Texan identity, from cowboys to rodeos to barbecue to country western music, arose straight out of that ecosystem. So if we're going to teach kids and adults about where they live in the world, we have to teach them about those ecosystems. And when we plant, when we have native plantings like these pocket prairies, that opens up a door for us to talk about that. Reason number two, and this is really critical, we're not just trying to save the monarch butterflies, the native bees, and the beautiful native birds that inhabit our area. We're trying to save those plants too. So many of the plants that we have in our area have become relatively rare uh, given their historic values because they are uh, basically, many of our local prairies were plowed just like they were in the Midwest and in other places uh, to give rise to agriculture or they were grazed uh, very heavily um, in our cattle industry. So one of the things that I always tell people is by planting native plants instead of exotic plants uh, in your area, you can also be a plant conservationist. You can do both. You can save the birds and the butterflies and the, and the bees and save the plants at the same time. Um, and that's really critical because a lot of indigenous plants have, uh, have seen setbacks from development. So we need to help those plants as well. The third reason is that we're avoiding unintended consequences. When we bring plants in from other parts of the world, uh, most are innocuous. They don't really have any problems. Um, but sometimes they become invasive, so they start to um, hurt the health of local ecosystems because they grow in an unchecked way because we don't have their, their enemies, we didn't bring their enemies with them. So they kind of grow unchecked and, and really impact local ecosystems in a really bad way. 
But sometimes uh, they don't become exotic, but they have these, these side uh, effects that we didn't anticipate. Here's a perfect example. One of the things that people do here in, uh, in Southeast Texas and in, and in other places is they plant something called tropical milkweed or butterfly weed. And conservation groups were, were pushing folks to do this for quite some time. Um, it is readily eaten by the monarch caterpillars. Um, you can put a few plants in and it's just mobbed by these, by these wonderful creatures. And so it looked like, wow, this is a really great way for people to help monarch butterflies in their yard. Well, it turns out that tropical milkweed has some deleterious effects, some bad effects from monarchs. One of which is that because it stays green throughout uh, the, the fall and into the winter, it actually stops monarch migration. Um, they should be heading south to go to the mountains of Mexico to spend the winter with millions of other monarch butterflies. But because they can still lay eggs and produce on these plants, they hang around. And so what that does is it does a couple things. One is it makes them more susceptible to dying during the winter time with a sudden freeze. Um, and it also, uh, these plants are also a vector for something called OE, which is a parasite that infects these monarch, uh, these monarch caterpillars and, and butterflies. And so we try to do something good for the monarch, and that should be applauded, but because we use something that's not native to this area, um, it had a bad side effect, and we can never quite predict how that's going to work. In contrast, if you look at the other three pictures of these native milkweeds from, from our area, they are actually adapted with monarch butterflies, and they actually fall apart at the right time of the year, and so they don't capture the butterflies here, they don't, they don't have them stay around, they don't, uh, we don't think that they transmit this parasite, or if not, they don't transmit it to the same degree. And so what you have is you have an insect, the monarch butterfly, and a plant that are perfectly designed and adapted as, as partners, and one lets the other go down to Mexico. So I think one of the things that we're always pressing is we don't always know what we're doing when we're putting plants into the environment, but because the local wildlife and the local plant life have had such an incredibly long and durable partnership over thousands of years, um, those plants can work uh, very much in favor of these wildlife and sometimes we don't know what exotic plants will do for our wildlife. Reason four is that native plants are often much more useful to wildlife than exotic species of plants. And that's because of this long and durable association that they've had. And this, this is true of birds as well. So one of the things that, that I will say is that many exotic plants are purchased for butterfly gardens or pollinator gardens because they have bright showy flowers and they have nectar sources. That's all great. But the, in truth, many of our local native species actually are not just nectar sources, they're sources of seed, because these insects have grown up with a long association with them. There are many species of insects that often eat the leaves. And because there are many more insects that can use those plants, the birds who require them to feed their young uh, insects, they can benefit more from these native plants than exotic plants, which oftentimes, if you look at exotic plants, look at the leaves. There's nothing or very few things eating those leaves. And so what it does is it doesn't provide the richness of the insect diversity that's necessary for a variety of animals, including birds. So, you know, a good example of this is rosinweed right there in the middle. So it's a great nectar plant. It also produces really, really fat, juicy seeds. Those seeds will be eaten by birds and by mammals and by other creatures. Um, and this is true of many of our species. Things eat the leaves, things eat the seeds, things drink the nectar. So much more of the plant is actually usable by wildlife than ex many exotic species, which are only good for nectar. And you can see this. Whenever we do a native uh, planting anywhere around the city, um, the insect life just explodes. So one of the things that we've done is we've looked at um, the MD Anderson uh, Pocket Prairie, uh, at the MD Anderson Cancer Center and the Texas Medical Center. It's just an amazing thing. And within about a year of putting it in place, these research researchers found a number of species that they were shocked to find. But it's not shocking in retrospect because 
because animals, wildlife, native wildlife are keyed towards finding these plant species because they're so well attuned with these. So we found a county record for a bee. We found um, a lot of 11 species of, of grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids in this small little planting that used to be a parking lot within about 15 months of it being established. It was just astounding. Here's a little video of uh, one of my favorite uh, teachers. His name is Jim Islib, and he teaches in Spring Branch at the Westchester Academy for International Studies. And he's going to tell you about this little pocket prairie that he put in maybe a year before this video was shot. And you can see how rapid um, the buildup of insect biodiversity happens on one of these little pocket prairies. Hey, this is Westchester Academy for International Studies. This is our pocket prairie that we put in this, uh, this uh, spring. And uh, before this was a biological desert, there was just single monoculture plant and absolutely no insects that you could collect. And if you could zoom in on this, this is just from a, a one minute sweep of the area. And the number and variety of insects is just absolutely amazing. And then the question is, where did they come from? If, if there was nothing here before, is it just, you know, put in a prairie and they'll come? And that's the only thing I can think because this is, this is completely reversed. Uh, it's, this is absolutely amazing. Okay, reason number five for why planting native matters. So as a conservation agency, our job is to protect native ecosystems and oftentimes to restore ecosystems when they've been damaged by people. And this happens in a variety of ways, uh, mostly unintentional, um, but we do have to restore these ecosystems to bring back their functionality for a variety of reasons, including bringing back native wildlife. And one of the things that uh, we say that, that conservation biologists do across the world is they use indigenous or native plants to restore community, local communities, ecosystems for wildlife. So, for instance, no conservation biologist would ever tell you to reconstruct panda habitat using trees from South America or grasses from Africa or uh, bushes from... Uh, Europe. That wouldn't be good conservation biology practice. Similarly, you would never have an African um, conservation biologist try to restore African lion habitat by incorporating trees from North America or grasses from, from um, Europe or other things. It's just a common practice to, to know that rebuilding the indigenous plant life of an area is the best way of rebuilding the indigenous animal life, or the wildlife value. So one of the things that we're trying to do by, by creating pockets of habitat using native plants instead of exotic plants is we're trying to avoid mixed conservation messaging. If we tell people to use exotic plants um, to restore uh, habitat in the middle of the city or in parks or things like that, it, it doesn't jive with what we do on a large landscape scale. Um, we know that the best things we can do when we're working in rural contexts or out in the country is to restore that indigenous plant community. So why would we tell people in the city that the best thing they can do is to put a bunch of exotic species from someplace else? When the native plant materials are available, we believe very strongly that people should be putting in those native plants because those are going to serve wildlife the best. We don't want uh, to mix our conservation messages. Um, because we want to try to use the best plant material in every context, whether it's in the city, park, or on the landscape on the Katy Prairie. And here's the last point about using natives. Now, this may be a bridge too far for many people, but we believe it. We believe that these plants are not there to serve an engineering function. They're not just there to feed a bunch of animals. They themselves are members of our community. And just like we don't like, we wouldn't think about substituting people in our community for people somewhere else that are prettier or smarter or whatever characteristic we're, we, we like. We don't substitute people in our community. We don't substitute um, organisms in our community either. 
We believe, uh, much like Aldo Leopold stated many, many decades ago, that we live in a community that is uh, interwoven, that is created with both humans, native plants, native wildlife, the soils, the land, it all is a, is a unit. And so what we want to do is we want to be good neighbors to our other neighbors who are the native plants. We want to give them a place to be because they deserve a place in our community. They've been here for tens of thousands of years. I'm going to conclude by reading this, this uh, wonderful uh, quote from Aldo Leopold. He said, the land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include the soils, waters, plants, and animals, or collectively the land. In short, a land ethic changes the role of homo sapiens, humans, from conqueror of the land community to plain member and citizen of it. It implies respect for his fellow members and also respect for the community as such. So, this may be a bridge too far for some folks, but we do believe that native plants and native wildlife are members of our community and they deserve a spot. And so we're not going to substitute their place for exotic plants that come from somewhere else because otherwise they don't have places to be. Now, we recognize that finding native plant materials are not easy all the time, for sure. Great way of getting some native plant material to your house is contacting your local native plant society, going out on a field trip, collecting some seeds, growing them up. If you don't want to do that, uh, oftentimes in your area there are native plant uh, sources in Houston here, um, we have a number of uh, places to get some native plants, in particular uh, prairie plants, places like the Houston Arboretum and Hannah Native Grasses and Morningstar Prairie Plants and Joshua's Native Plants at times. Sometimes there are going to be wild plant sales or native plant sales in your area. Here in Houston, we have the Wildscapes Workshop, uh, which is put on the Native Plant Society of Texas, the Houston chapter. Uh, the Mercer Arboretum has a great March Mart with some native plant selections. The Houston Arboretum has a great plant sale. And... Um, and there's also seed catalogs that provide native plant material like our friends uh, at Native American Seed and Junction. So we recognize that you can't always find native plants, that exotic plants have definitely a role to play in our world in terms of making the world a more beautiful place, a more sentimental place. But we also believe that as a conservation agency, we have a, a role, uh, and that role is to advise people on what to plant for maximum value for wildlife and we believe that indigenous plants are the best way to go if you can go that way. Thank you for listening to me um, and I'm looking forward to hearing any comments that you might have about what I said in this video and let's let the dialogue flow. Thanks so much.